middle of our heifer development series and we've had some outstanding presentations thus far and look forward to uh, Dr. Johnson's presentation here today and then two following this one in the next couple of weeks. Uh, just uh, remember that these uh, each one of these sessions are recorded and you can access those at beef.okstate.edu. My name is David Lawman. I'm an extension beef cattle specialist here at Oklahoma State University. I have a split extension and research appointment. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, I'm part of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service where we have uh, uh, folks available in every county in the state of Oklahoma to assist you with questions re related to agriculture. And so if you have uh, needs or questions, be sure and contact your local extension educator and then also our area area specialists are available as well. Uh, let's see. Let's. Uh, I'm going to ask our, my other two co-hosts to introduce themselves right quick. I'll jump in here. I'm Rosalyn Biggs. I am a beef cattle extension specialist as well as the director of continuing education at the College of Veterinary Medicine. We're just excited to have Dr. Johnson on with us uh, in, in a really busy time, I know, uh, for him. And so we appreciate him carving out uh, some time to, to visit with us today and uh, glad that all our attendees could, could join us again. If you've uh, perhaps missed one of the presentations, we do have these recorded and they are available on beef.okstate.edu. And we also have some really uh, exciting plans, I think, for upcoming series too. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Beck. Thank you, Dr. Beggs. I'm Paul Beck. I'm a beef extension specialist as well at the state office in Stillwater. Uh, my focus is uh, stalker cattle and feedlot nutrition and management. Um, I'm, once again, this has a, been a great series and I'm mostly stoked about Dr. Johnson presenting because we almost had a conflict with this because they're actually having some youth events uh, at, in Oklahoma City. So I'm, I'm really glad that things, those kind of things are starting to open up and, and I'm really happy that, that Mark could be here with us today. Thank you. Okay, well with that, uh, as we've mentioned, Dr. Johnson is our speaker today, just a brief uh, introduction. Uh, Dr. Johnson has been a faculty member here at Oklahoma State University for some time. He also has a split appointment with teaching and extension. Uh, Dr. Johnson has a lot of experience in the area of heifer development as he has made these kind of decisions for many years. Uh, he cord is, it serves as the faculty coordinator of our seed stock operation here in the, in the uh, food and animal, or animal and food sciences department. And he's uh, coordinated that facility. I don't know, Dr. Johnson, uh, how many years has it been? You'll have to unmute yourself there, Dr. Johnson. I thought I did. Okay. <laughs> okay. 29 years. 29 years. Okay. My goodness. He's also coached uh, the livestock judging team for a long time, is no longer uh, serving that capacity, but has a tremendous amount of experience uh, relative to heifer selection from that standpoint as well. So, uh, Dr. Johnson, we're excited uh, to, to get your comments here today, and uh, we'll just go ahead and turn it over to you. Sounds great. Thank you, Dave, and it is a pleasure to get to join you guys today. I'm asking this up front. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Can everyone see the screen okay? Yeah, looks good, Mark. Okay. We will proceed again. Good to be with you guys and uh, appreciate the opportunity to discuss this a little bit today. And we're going to come at this from some different approaches and different ideas to try to hopefully spur some questions and commentary as we work our way through. The, the title itself is interesting to me as we identify sire selection, 
that is something that's very important. Uh, dystocia, we will define and talk about specific ways that we could select to improve calving ease and cow herds. The concept of performance gets kind of broad and we'll address that as we work our way through here as well. But uh, sire selection itself is critical to make genetic improvement over time. Um, we know that about 80 to 90 percent of genetic improvement is a result of sire selection uh, for perspective. One thing I always share with students in animal breeding, typically a bull has as much genetic impact in siring one calf crop as the normal cow does in her entire lifetime of productivity. Uh, we can be pretty effective in sire selection for traits that can be objectively measured and quantified with a linear measurement in basing our selection on EPDs. Uh, we know that selection based on EPDs is somewhere in the ballpark of seven to nine times more effective than just basing our selection on an individual's phenotype or even within her ratio. And without getting into the details of matrix algebra and how EPDs are generated, uh, we know that all that individual performance data within contemporary groups, along with relationships within breeds, are all working together to permit us to generate EPDs. And in the past 15 years, um, we've came even further now through DNA testing, and we have what we refer to as genomically enhanced EPDs. So when we can, and if we have an EPD for a trait, selection based on EPDs is gonna be very effective. Uh, nice thing about making genetic change or genetic improvement, and I would like to think we could use those two terms interchangeably, but uh, when we build up the frequencies of de desired genes and we have those in a population of animals, genetic change is cumulative and permanent. Uh, the impact of those genes doesn't go away as long as they keep getting passed through the generations and remain in our cow herd, uh, they're gonna continue to do what they do. Uh, another nice thing about EPDs is they are directly comparable across time and geography. If we take a look at a bull, say we find him in our sire summary or uh, whatever, he, he may be in our pasture. He may be a five, 10 year old herd bull. The EPDs that he would have relative to the breed he's from are directly comparable to the EPDs of a bull that's born this year. Uh, EPDs of a bull being used in the Western part of the United States are comparable to those EPDs of bulls on the eastern half of the United States. So EPDs eliminate environmental bias and permit us to compare apples to apples for a trait that we're interested in improving. Um, I always like to think that nothing pays for itself uh, quicker than a good herd bull. If you think about genetic impact and the influence that they have on performance for traits that are economically important to us, uh, a very effective means of trying to improve our bottom line profitability is identifying genetics that are gonna pay in our specific operation. I always address, and a concept that we get into in a lot of discussions is the concept of analyzing our production system. If we take a look at where we're at and the genotype of our existing population of cattle, the production environment that we're raising those in, what kind of management constraints and fixed resources we have in our production system, the economics of our production system. Is it practical for us to sell calves at weaning? Is it a more viable option to run those as stockers and sell them as yearlings? Are we gonna be selling our calves all the way through the finishing segment? Uh, decisions that we base bull selection on should take into account when we intend to market those calves. And another thing that is pertaining to today's discussion is do we intend to use bulls on heifers or mature cows? Not every bull we find is gonna be a good fit to our production system. And we might identify a bull that we, we like a lot of EPDs and a lot of on foot characteristics about, but based on the analyzation of our system and those factors we discuss, he may not be an optimum fit to try to improve profitability for us. Uh, 
From that, we move on to talking about dystocia. Uh, what is it? Basically calving difficulty. And we can kind of lump it into three big categories and kind of in order of importance relative to what is the most likely cause of dystocia. First one is just, we have got a calf fetus that will not actually fit through the pelvis. It could be caused by just too much biomass of the fetus. It could be caused by a shape issue that doesn't permit that fetus to get started through the pelvic area itself. Second problem or second biggest cause of dystocia is an abnormal presentation. Uh, we've got a calf coming backwards or something like that. The third cause that we see in literature is just what's referred to as a weak labor. And we don't have a heifer or a cow effectively trying to push that calf out. Uh, usually a result of cows that are in too thin a condition or potentially too fat, uh, that they don't try hard enough. But uh, we kind of lump that one back to a management thing. If in particular, we're looking to manage heifers going into calving season, if we can keep those right in the ballpark of a body condition score six, we're going to probably do more to eliminate those weak labors than we could worry about uh, selection for that. Uh, dystocia itself is far more likely to happen in first calf heifers. It is not typically a huge issue as we think about mature cow herds, but in heifers, it is typically a selection priority if we're picking out bulls to use on a set of virgin replacement heifers. If we look at sizes of calves and its impact on mortality, things like that, calf death loss typically within the first 24 hours runs less than 5% if we see calves born unassisted and it's going to be two to four times that if we actually are having to pull calves based on the degree of assistance that has to be given. Uh, if we take a look at birth weights of calves itself, typically at birth, heavier calves are more likely to require assistance. If we look a little beyond that, those calves that survive the first 24 to 48 hours of being born or post being born, I should say, are less likely to die and more likely to survive and get bigger on out through weaning. Uh, bull calves, as compared to heifer calves, and another thing that pertains to selection, I throw it in here because bull calves weigh about five pounds more than heifer calves at birth. If we are breeding AI, if we can use sex female semen on our heifers, um, on average, we're gonna take out a little birth weight by doing that. So just an idea to throw out on whether or not it is practical if you're in a calving ease situation. And final thought is just identifying if calving ease is a selection priority uh, and will less dystocia actually lead to a more profitable beef production system. I don't think anybody likes to pull calves. Uh, we have an aging demographic in, in farming and ranching. And uh, I know personally at the age of 56, I'm much less enthusiastic about wanting to pull a calf than I was 20 years ago. But that doesn't necessarily mean because we don't enjoy pulling calves that we have a dystocia issue or that it is necessarily always a selection priority or somewhere that we should be spending our bull buying dollar to try to reduce. So we'll get into that, use some examples, a little more here, a few slides down the road. So if we identify that calving ease is a selection priority for us, let's say we know we're gonna be using bulls on heifers, what are our specific EPDs or genetic values that we would base selection to improve calving ease on? Uh, basically three different ones. And I'm gonna use the definitions and the acronyms from the American Angus Association Sire Summary. It is possible as you look at some other beef breeds, these may be referred to by slightly different names, but in all beef breeds, we do have three fundamental genetic predictors that help us to try to eliminate dystocia. First one we're gonna address is what we refer to as calving ease direct or direct calving ease based on what breed sire summary you look in. What we're talking about here is an EPD that is based on percentages where a higher number indicates a greater likelihood of unassisted births 
if we are mating a bull to virgin heifers. So heritability of this trait is about 19%. It is what we refer to as a threshold trait. And by threshold trait, it means we are trying to predict the desired outcome, which is an unassisted birth. It's reported this way just because there are varying degrees of calving assistance um, from a slight pull all the way through a C-section, but ultimately what we're interested in selecting for is the unassisted birth itself. And so as a threshold trait, basically thing to remember here, bigger number increases the likelihood that we have an unassisted birth. An example of this, we've got two bulls. Bull A has got a calving ease direct EPD of five. Bull B has a calving ease direct EPD of 16. What are those things telling us? If we mate both those bulls to a set of yearling replacement heifers, we are 11% less likely to pull a calf or assist a calf being born that is sired by bull B. So that's our calving ease direct. The next EPD that we can select for to try to eliminate dystocia, and the one that's been around the longest actually from the first use of sire summaries and genetic prediction, birth weight was our means of selecting for calving ease. It is a trait that is expressed in pounds and it is a predictor of how big we'd expect one sire's calves to be relative to the birth EPD of another sire. It's a little more highly heritable at about 46%. It is a normally distributed trait rather than a threshold trait. And our example of it, if bull C has a birth weight EPD of negative seven tenths and bull D has a birth weight EPD of 3.3, the calves sired by bull D are gonna weigh about four pounds more than the calves sired by bull C. And I think we may still have a typo at the bottom of that, but uh, bull C being the lower birth weight of the two with about four pounds difference, we're gonna to expect to see calves sired by bull C at four pounds lighter. So as we get back to those two big fundamental or primary cause of dystocia, the two big things that won't permit the calf to fit through the pelvic area being size or shape, both of these two kind of give us a means to select the birth weight itself. If we take out more birth weight, we end up with a smaller fetus more likely to pass through. By selecting for calving ease direct, we're probably tending to select for more things that pertain to the shape of that fetus. Maybe it's a little more slender up through the head and shoulders area, permits it to get started. So through the use of both of these, uh, permits us to try to eliminate or find calving ease bulls that we can use on heifers. Calving ease maternal, as we think next generation, is another useful EPD, uh, particularly if we're looking at using bulls as rotational sires, meaning we're gonna keep daughters out of those bulls, be calving out those daughters. In this case, we're dealing with another threshold trait. It is predicting the likelihood of unassisted births out of a bull's daughters. Um, we, again, we say it's the next generation maternal predictor, but what is it fundamentally telling us? If bull E has got a calving ease maternal of eight and bull F has got a calving ease maternal of 13, we're calving out the daughters of those two bulls and those daughters are mated to the same sire. We are 5% less likely to pull a calf out of one of bull F's daughters than we are out of one of bull E's. So we are more likely to see the daughters of bulls calving unassisted. And so that's why we say next generation. Again, kind of a lowly heritable trait, and again, a threshold trait predicting the likelihood of the outcome that we actually want to have. Um, I relate back to what we had a few slides ago when we said that EPDs are comparable across time and geography, and there is value in knowing what the EPDs of our current herd sires are, and we'll think through some ideas here together on that. Let's say that we've got an Angus bull. We've been using him for five years in a rotational mating system. We're running a two breed rotation, the other breed being Hereford. We're gonna say the bull's tagged 5,100. 
He's got a calving ease EPD of three. He's got a birth weight EPD of four. He's got a weaning weight EPD of 50 and a calving ease maternal of eight. So a couple of different situations we address that bull in. Let's say that we are over the past five years pulling 30% of the calves that he sires out of our first calf heifers. And we're pulling 25% of the calves that he sires out of his daughters. So I think we would all agree we've got a calving issue and we're providing a lot more assistance than we should have to. So we identify our selection priority, which is to reduce dystocia. So what is our means of accomplishing that? Again, using bull 5100's EPDs as a reference point, we are gonna to wanna to identify a new herd sire we can use that is an improvement over him in calving ease direct, calving ease maternal by finding higher EPDs there and a lower birth weight EPD than what that bull had. So identifying and, and looking up that bull and we're gonna make reference to websites and doing some stuff online here. But uh, if we have lost our registration paper, don't know where we put it, it may be five years old, the EPDs that uh, we bought that bull on. We can look that bull up in the registry, see what his current EPDs are. And again, using that as a reference point, it permits us to go out and find a new herd sire to try to eliminate some of this dystocia that we're dealing with by improving upon these three numbers. Now, different situation. Let's say that over the past five years, using that same bull, 5,100, we have not pulled a single calf that he sired. We have not pulled a calf out of one of his daughters, but we sell all our steer calves at weaning and those steer calves are averaging 375 pounds. Now I'm throwing that out as an extreme example. Not that there aren't some parts of the United States that a 375 pound weaning weight wouldn't be all bad, but it seems a little light as we think about central Oklahoma weaning weights. And so if this situation and we identify selection priorities, we definitely wanna maintain this level of calving ease. So that bull's EPDs being a reference point, we would wanna find the next herd sire that potentially improves other economically important traits. If we routinely sell calves at weaning and wanna improve upon that 375 pound weaning weight, we identify another bull to purchase at or better, the same calving ease direct birth weight and calving ease maternal, but we find one that's stronger in our weaning weight EPD. Going back to what we said earlier, uh, maybe we sell our calves as yearlings and we identify in this situation, we're not getting enough yearling weight. That's the EPD that we try to improve while maintaining this level of calving ease. Other situations, maybe we retain ownership all the way through finishing. And so it becomes carcass merit and feed conversion and a lot of the growth that goes all the way through the finishing segment that we wanna select for and try to improve. And so the concept of improving performance depends on when we intend to market a set of calves and, and what traits we wanna to identify to improve aside from just calving ease situations. So since EPDs can be compared across generations and environment, knowing the EPDs of the bulls we are using uh, help us to identify where we should be spending our bull buying dollar in the future to improve profitability. Again, performance, we've kind of talked about some of this as we've rolled through here. Uh, Dr. Lawman gave me this title to address and, and it is a, it's a very fruitful topic. There's a lot of things we could go into, but performance itself is, can be subdivided out into a lot of different categories. And as we think of analyzation of our system and, and identifying herd sires to try to improve our bottom line, that can be in the form of maternal performance, uh, higher percent calf crop weaned, higher percentage of cows mature weight that's being weaned off annually, a lot of different stuff there. Growth performance at whatever marketing endpoint that we're looking at or carcass performance if we're going all the way through finishing. 
Um, I referred earlier to some online tools and things that we have at our disposal. And I'm just gonna refer to the one I'm most familiar with, the American Angus Association. You can go to their website and find the SIRE evaluation report. And one of the really handy things that you could do, and we're not gonna get into it in my presentation today, but uh, I would sure be willing to help anybody that had questions or curiosities about using it if you wanna contact me at some point after my presentation. But you can click on SIRE evaluation report and there is a feature there that permits you to search the Angus SIRE report and it would permit you to plug in parameters of EPDs as a minimum or maximum while searching for the best bulls in the breed in other areas. If we wanted to go back to that example a couple slides ago and look at bull 5100, and we were in the situation where we were not experiencing dystocia, we could go in and plug in his birth weight EPD as a maximum, his calving ease direct and calving ease maternal EPDs as minimums, and then potentially go search for what the best bulls are for weaning weight, yearling weight, residual average daily gain, marbling or other carcass traits. But a pretty handy feature and it's not unique to the Angus breed, the, the only place you're gonna find that, but uh, something that is available for use and a pretty handy tool. Um, again, referring to American Angus Association and just information we can find in their sire summary and I thought about throwing some growth curves up here and taking a look at what we've done as far as genetic trend. But one of the topics that we're gonna get into in the next few minutes is just about selection for multiple traits. And when I was a student at OSU back in the eighties, we were taught that because of the high genetic correlation between weights at all ages, that if we wanted a calving ease bull we were gonna to have to sacrifice weaning growth and yearling growth, and we we're gonna have smaller mature cows. And if we wanted growth, then we we're gonna to have to sacrifice calving ease. One of the things that we can look at the genetic trend information in about any beef breed and see that has happened over the past 30 years is we have not just kept birth weights and improved calving ease, but we've actually made a pretty significant improvement in some breeds while we have actually improved weaning weights and yearling weights along the way. And I mention that because it's evidence that even though these traits have a good, good degree of genetic correlation between them, that we can select for lower birth and more, less dystocia while simultaneously improving weaning and yearling weight over time if we can identify the sires that are genuinely curve benders and use those in selection programs. The evidence is there. Another thing that we see as we look at genetic trend information is that we haven't done a lot to put selection pressure on lowering mature cow size. I mentioned that relative to improving performance, uh, one of the things that could improve maternal performance would be to reduce mature cow size and if we Think about some of the indexes or measurements of that just relative to getting a higher percent of cows on a herd wide basis or cow herds to wean off a higher percentage of their mature weight in some cases could be accomplished as much by just taking a little of that mature weight out as it could be accomplished by doing some other things along the way in the production chain. So using multiple EPDs and selection programs has been shown to work, it can work, and it will work. Kind of shifting gears, moving to my next point. Uh, plenty of evidence that tells us that uh, heifers that don't experience dystocia at calving are gonna have shorter postpartum intervals, they're gonna return to fertile heats earlier the following breeding season, and as a consequence of that, they're gonna be calving earlier the following year. Also evidence that tells us that those heifers that calve easily without dystocia issues just do a better job of milking and raising their first calf. So we think about the significance of that. 
what does it mean if we avoid dystocia calving out our heifers? We're gonna end up seeing a higher percentage of those getting pregnant, calving, and a higher percent calf crop weaned. Uh, we're gonna see more calves born earlier the following calving season. And if we have calves born earlier in a calving season, um, figuring that pre-weaning calves gain somewhere in a ballpark of two pounds a day, even if we aren't putting a lot of selection pressure on weaning growth, the typical calf, if he's born one heat cycle sooner, if he's got 21 days more age by the time we wean him off, that's going to equate to a little over 40 pounds of additional weaning weight, regardless of his actual weaning growth potential. So we tend to improve growth performance as a result of avoiding dystocia, if you think about it in those terms. More pounds of calves weaned per exposed female, and again, entire cow herds weaning off a higher percentage of their mature body weight are all impacts of avoiding dystocia, seeing more heifers get bred quicker as two-year-olds and calving a little earlier as three-year-olds. And bottom line profitability as a consequence of that is gonna improve. Um, final thoughts, uh, calving ease is very important. It doesn't always mean that calving ease is a key to profitability based on where we're at with it right now or whether or not we're using a bull on heifers. But bull selection itself is critical to profitability. Um, you wanna select bulls with the genetic potential to add profitability to your production system. And I throw out a question, and this is one of the survey questions that you've got as well, but uh, everybody weigh in with an opinion on this. We are going through our pastures calving season. We find two newborn calves. The calves are vigorous, they're healthy, they are nursing and they already have a belly full of colostrum. We got calf 2101 that weighs 58 pounds. We got calf 2102 that weighs 75 pounds. Which calf would you rather have? Which calf would you rather find? Dave, is it possible to get some responses here or chat questions? You bet they can, they can just type it in the chat. We encourage you to do that. But Mark, will uh, if you wanna go ahead and finish up your summary there, I'll, I'll uh, read, read those off to you as we go okay. along. It's like most everybody's voting for 75 at the moment, 75 pound calf. Sounds good. And my final thought is profitable beef production is more likely to result from selection for multiple traits of economic importance than selection for extremes in one or possibly just a handful of traits. Uh, kind of a balanced approach based on identifying profit centers what traits are going to relate to those profit centers and trying to base bull selection and spend our bull buying dollar on all the things that are going to lead to profitability for us. With that, open it up to questions. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. I've got a few questions here. Folks are still voting on those two calves. Uh, but let's start off with, uh, let's see, in the Q&A, <clears throat> we've got a question about your thoughts relative to selecting for shorter gestation lengths. It's a good question. I, I think one of the things we have seen in the past 30 years is as we select, for a long time, we didn't have a, a calving ease direct EPD to select for. But as we selected to keep birth weights down and lower birth weights, we indirectly selected to reduce gestation length. And I think that we find in a lot of beef breeds that selection for lower birth weight and improved calving ease has taken some gestation length out. Okay. All right, so next uh, question about distinguishing between genetic improvement and herd improvement. Genetic improvement versus herd improvement? Yes. I'll, 
I'm going to address this as I would understand the question. Uh, I think, let me, and I may not be interpreting the question right, so I'll take a stab at this, and if we need to, to go at it again, we can, but I think as we look at our production system and, and get back to some of that stuff that we addressed there early on, if our production environment and our management system is fairly constant year to year, and we're marketing calves at the same time, managing our cow herd the same way, so that part of it is consistent, that genetic improvement, if we're identifying the, the right traits to improve in our production system that lead to profitability, genetic improvement should lead to herd improvement. And that may have been a swing and a miss at the question. If so, we can clarify the question and go again. All right. Sounds good. So Moinina, if, you, uh, if you'd like uh, more clarification, just just jump in there and type uh, maybe an extension of the question. So Dr. Johnson, next question, uh, what is the heritability for average daily gain, weaning weight, and yearling weight? Heritability of average daily gain, weaning weight, and yearling weight? Yes, sir. They're all gonna be traits that fall somewhere in that moderate degree of heritability. Uh, depending on the sire summary or what literature you look at, generally growth traits are moderately heritable, meaning you're going to fall somewhere 25 to 45 percent. Right. Very good. I've got a question for you. Uh, you know, I hear occasionally I'll hear folks say, uh, you know, let's say they don't have EPDs of bulls that they have several years of history on in terms of dystocia or calving ease, uh, or maybe they're new to the industry. Where would you recommend they start? Let's say their priority is, is uh, selection for calving ease. In other words, they're gonna breed heifers. Where would you recommend they start in the Angus breed in both calving ease direct and birth weight? Dave, let me make sure. Are you talking about what level those EPDs to select for, or just yeah? yeah. We're looking for a heifer bull. Yeah, where's the where do you draw the line? Typically, I think in about any breed, if we look at those average EPDs by birth year, or what we would just tend to think of as what is the kind of baseline for genetic trend. I think the calving ease bulls are always gonna start at somewhere better than average. Meaning that uh, if we were looking at Angus bulls and we saw that the average Angus bull born in 2020 had a birth weight EPD of 1.1, then to be ahead of the curve, we would wanna identify bulls with a lower birth weight EPD than that. And if calving ease direct, if the average for those calves born in the past year was say seven, then we would want to be better than that number or higher. Okay. And where we go from that gets back to, you know, that's our first reference point. If, if we don't have any information on the herd sires we've been using, but uh, where we go from there is how extreme do we want to take it? Are we in a situation where we never have an opportunity to check heifers that are gonna be calving a year from now? And if that's the case, then the higher your calving ease direct can get, the lower your birth weight can get, leads you down that path to greater likelihood of calving ease. Okay. All right, next question. Is there an accuracy advantage and less bias in genomic versus EPD estimated traits. So I, I take that to mean straight genomic or DNA information uh, versus- It's gonna be more accuracy. I don't, I don't know what, when we say less bias, I, I don't know how to answer that, but the advantage of genomically enhanced EPDs is that 
it's about the equivalent of seeing a bull sire a calf crop that we get that bump in accuracy from DNA typing. And it depends on the trait. And it's not like seeing 25 calves for every trait. And right now we have 20 some genetic values being predicted in Angus cattle and for that matter, most beef breeds. But uh, the progeny equivalence that uh, DNA typing and genomically enhanced DPDs get, as we still say as a general rule of thumb about the equivalent of letting them sire a calf crop as far as the bump to their accuracy and thereby then the faith that we can put in to those EPDs that they have. Very good. All right, uh, Doctor. Uh, here's another question, Doctor Biggs and Beck. Uh, you all jump in if you have additional comments or questions. Uh, it says uh, here's a here's a good question. It's, it says off topic, but how many cows can a bull settle per day? Uh, and, and then the comment: five calves born in. A, I, I think that means I had five calves born in a three-day period. But general question is: how many cows can a bull settle in a day? Probably depends on the bull, uh, but getting multiple cows bred in a day is a definite possibility. How far we stretch that, uh, I don't know if, if there's a good answer. Uh, it's sure possible we could have half dozen cows in heat on one day and maybe a bull gets them all settled, natural service. Um, some bulls may not be capable of that, some bulls may be capable of more. Okay, a couple more here. Let's see, did we, maybe, maybe yeah, we got, got some background noise, so I'm, I'm peering in closer to try to hear. <laughs> okay. Uh, this one says in your rotation example of Angus Harper Bulls, do you want them to be similar in calving ease for one trait, for example? Well, if calving ease is a priority, then you're going to be selecting for calving ease out of both breeds, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Okay. My, uh, my last question, Dr. Johnson, uh, you know, today, when you look through, um, you search the, let's say, the young sire summary. Uh, you can find, or, or even a sale catalog with yearling bulls, you can find a few sires today with extreme high yearling weight and really good calving ease direct and relatively low birth weight. So let's say an Angus around the calving ease direct of eight, nine, or 10, and, and a birth weight of somewhere between half a pound to slightly negative with a yearling weight, for crying out loud, 150 to maybe 170. So based on your presentation here today, my take would be that you would give, even though that bull has a tremendous potential for growth, I mean, you kind of have to separate the two traits, correct? You, you, you don't use the yearling weight as more concern that he's going to increase in calving ease uh, or decrease in calving ease direct increase in birth weight over time. How, how do you, how do you deal with that in young sires? Well, I think that that's the benefit of having EPDs is that there is so much data that's been taken into account at this point that we're able to base those genetic values on that if we've got, even in young sires, um, if it tells you that you're looking at a low birth weight EPD and a high weaning or high yearling EPD, that is our best estimate of their genetic potential to transmit to those traits. And so, particularly in the situation where maybe they've got genomically enhanced EPDs, they've already been DNA typed, and we've got even higher accuracies with them, even though they're young sires. Uh, I, I think you can, you can pretty much look at them without casting a suspicious eye. You can say, wow, okay. that's a genuine curve bender. Yeah. And it is through, you know, looking back again, 
I know I didn't put the charts and tables up there of genetic trend, but uh, we, can, we can go back and name names of sires that have been identified going back to the early 1990s that were the, the bulls we identified that were low birth, high growth, that got us to where we are today. So I think that's one of the great benefits of EPD-based selection. Yeah. Mark, I have a, a, a question to just get you a, to give a statement on this because I keep running into... Paul, I appreciate the resonance of your voice. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of background noise here, so please go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Right now I'm embarrassed. <laughs> but I keep running into um, operations or producers that identify a, a calf out in, on pasture, you know, maybe pure bred or somewhat pure bred, but just has some eye appeal, you know, low birth weight, um, probably not even weighed, but it appears to be low birth weight. And they'll select that as a uh, herd sire. Um, you know, no registration, no EPDs uh, to, to go along with that. Um, can you kind of touch touch on the desirability of, of doing that and, and some of the risks involved? I would refer back to, can I go back through my slides? Oh yeah, sure. it's working now. Early on, when we talked about Selection based on EPDs is seven to nine times more effective than using weights or performance data alone or even in her ratios. And so, Dr. Beck, where I'm coming from there is it's sure possible we might identify a bull that we didn't weigh, may not be a purebred, may not be registered, and he may work for us. He may accomplish what we want to accomplish. Uh, but we're seven to nine times more likely to be identifying the right genetics for us if we can base that off of an animal that's pedigreed, going to have to be pedigreed in order to have EPDs and identify the, the traits that we want to improve and, and select on EPDs. And that's, that isn't to say, and it's an interesting question because I'm down here at the first ever Cattlemen's Congress, and we're here showing cattle, and there's going to be a lot of cattle. I think there's something like 22 sales down here in 14 days, and there's going to be a lot of cattle bought and sold at this event that we're going to get outside of traits that can be objectively measured and quantified with a number. There, there's going to be value in cattle that is based on things that are subjectively evaluated. And that's a topic for another day. But if it's a birth weight, if it's a calving ease score, if it's a weaning weight, a marbling score, if it falls under that umbrella of things that we talking, talk about being able to measure and quantify with a number, then those numbers coupled with pedigree information and it's got to be pedigreed animals that are registered that permit us to account for pedigree relationship in them for accurate genetic prediction. We are seven to nine times more accurate to base selection for those traits on EPDs. So that's a very good question. So you get what you pay for whenever you're buying a, a known commodity. You get what you pay for. If, if you know that traits A, B, and C are the three traits that make you money and lead to profitability in your production system, going and basing your selection of bulls on EPDs for traits A, B, and C is the most effective thing you can do. But you got to identify those traits and I think one of the things that we get into in the cattle industry is identifying those traits that lead to profitability for us. It can literally be different for two producers in the same county based on taking a look at how and when they market a set of calves, 
how they manage a set of calves and things like that. So I always get back to identifying the traits that are economically relevant in your production system first and go select bulls accordingly. Here's a good addition to that question, Dr. Johnson. This would DNA aid in bull selection when EPDs are not available. Dave, can you repeat that, please? It says, uh, would DNA aid in the bull selection when EPDs are not available? DNA is a means to get more accurate EPDs. So if we, again, we're getting a little, we're going outside the box here a little bit, but let's say, for example, I've got a bull from Breed X. He's a registered pedigreed bull. I'm going to contact my breed association to submit DNA on that bull. And they'll show me the right paperwork and how to go about getting that done. And accordingly, they're going to take a look and that's going to tweak and change his EPDs and boost the accuracy associated with each one of those EPDs. So if I go out here, let's say I, I see my, a bull calf of my neighbors running around in his pasture and I like him. And so I go by the bull calf, grow him out. He's a yearling. I don't know what breed he is. I don't have a pedigree. N no, that basically is the answer. I can't just send off DNA somewhere and get a set of EPDs on that bull. Am I making sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, outstanding. A great turnout today. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, uh, don't uh, miss next week, Dr. Jordan Thomas. Uh, he he is going to give us a you know confident that uh, those of you who are interested in artificial insemination, improving your efficiency with those programs, uh, he is going to have tremendous information for us. You know, if you got some of these uh, bull stud catalogs this year, you, you probably noticed a brand new synchronization protocol for beef cows. Uh, the preliminary data on that synchronization protocol is outstanding. And that comes directly from their laboratory there at the University of Missouri. He is one of the leading experts right now in the country on that topic. So I sure hope you'll uh, join us next week. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. We asked you please uh, fill out your survey as you as you leave the meeting here today. Dr. Biggs, Dr. Beck, anything else? I just thought we might um, have Dr. Johnson maybe address his question a little bit. Uh, we had uh, the majority of votes, of course, were for the heavier yeah. calf, but we did have a couple for the smaller calf. So uh, yeah. maybe we're cheating our survey a little bit, but... Um, Dr. Johnson, you want to address address your question maybe with... Uh, yes, I would be glad to. Right and I, I'm glad you brought that up because I thought that would uh, lead to some discussion and we almost forgot to talk about it very much. But I, I'm curious, Dr. Biggs, what was the consensus again on the, the response to that? I don't have the exact count, but just kind of going through the chat, I think we probably had eight to 10 for the heavier calf and um, two or three for the lighter calf. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm gonna give my perspective on this. And again, I don't think anybody wants to pull a calf. Uh, so I'm throwing that out there first. I know I don't, I've never really met anybody that did. What we wanna find, whether we're calving out our heifers or our cows, we wanna find healthy, vigorous calves that have nursed and are off to a good start. And so if we reduce birth weight, yes, that is a means to get less calving difficulty. But once we get to that threshold, if we've achieved, we've, we've reduced or eliminated dystocia, then I would rather have the extra 17 pounds of calf at day one than a lighter calf. And if they're both born unassisted and they're healthy and going, we should have accomplished, we should have gotten to that threshold. So that would be my take on it. And, you know, just looking ahead, if we wean all those calves on the same day, 
well, we started off with one that was 17 pounds heavier. So we basically had 17 pounds of weaning weight in him on day one. Now, regardless of what, you know, they both weaned off at later or whatever weight we sold them at. So I, I think we want to accomplish calving ease, but when we get there, a lighter calf isn't always necessarily better. All right, very good. Does that lead to any further chat questions? No, I don't see any right off the right off hand. We, as Dr. Biggs mentioned, we did have a couple of uh, votes for the lighter calf. I think one of them said that uh, indicated uh, they preferred the lighter calf because there'd be less stress on the on the female, on the cow. You'd like to like to comment on that? Well, I, I guess as I pose the question. I, I'm throwing out there that if both calves are up and vigorous and born unassisted and nursing, that there wasn't much stress on either of the cows that had them. Yeah. And and obviously, if if one of them, if it was a four hour labor versus a four minute labor, that would be a different factor to take into account. But I, I my response is based on those things being equal and a stress-free labor in both cases. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Look forward to seeing you next week and happy new year. Thank you, Dave. Thank you again, Mark.